It is rumoured that during the 9th century, somewhere deep within the heart of Ethiopia, there lived a shepherd by the name of Kaldi. One day, forced away from his usual route, he led his sheep into a thicket of bushes with bright red berries, which he thought to be cherries. He noticed that as the sheep chewed on these berries, their behaviour became suddenly... peculiar. Being a scientific lad, he chewed on the berries himself. Displeased by their bitterness, he threw the remaining berries from his hand into a serendipitously located fire. An enticing aroma wafted into his nostrils, and little did he know that humankind would never be the same again. Alas, how will Charlie ever find the perfect cup of coffee to win the heart of sweet, sweet Lila? Charlie, I am the coffee genie. Put down your books. They will not give you what you seek. Let me show you coffee in its purest, truest form. For only then will you win sweet Lila's love. We begin with the <coughs> the plant. The coffee beans are seeds of plants from the Rubiaceae family of the genus Coffea. Although coffee is known primarily for its energizing effect, it rarely contains over 3% caffeine by weight. Before the coffee beans are ready for roasting, their water content is reduced from 65% to about 12% by spreading them out under the sun for four weeks. But what makes the beans brown? Roasting. It's a pyrolytic process that increases the chemical complexity of the beans. Unroasted coffee has about 250 different volatile, that is, reactive molecules, while roasted has over 800 different molecular species, and more molecules means more flavour. Chemically, these beans are constituted of glucose and other reducing sugars, along with amino acids, fatty oils and minerals. At high heat, the reducing sugars combine with the amino acids in a reaction known as the Maillard reaction. This is essentially the same reaction that happens when you caramelize sugar or heat a steak. Steak and coffee? Indeed, my boy. Indeed. The end products of roasting are brown and bittersweet oils, along with carbon dioxide and water. As we heat up the bean, the water dries up and evaporates. Simultaneously, the carbon dioxide expands since volume is proportional to temperature from the ideal gas law. Now, the bean volume expands by one and a half times, and the coffee mass decreases by a fifth. The ideal gas law also states that the pressure increases with temperature, so the weak cell walls and the coating of oil in the coffee bean burst with a popping sound. Time is essential. Short roasting gives the coffee a metallic bitterness that comes from the polyphenols, which don't have enough time to react, so the full aromas don't develop and the coffee is acidic. Too long, and all the flavours evaporate. Next, we grind the roasted beans. Grinding is all about surface area. Here the same orange is more surface area when cut in half, since now more of the orange is exposed. Suppose we want to break a big sphere into two half spheres. The volume remains the same, and so the radii are the same. But look, 
the combined surface area of the smaller spheres is one and a half times larger than that of the bigger sphere. To a first approximation, this is what happens when you grind coffee beans. We want to maximize the surface area because the more it is, the more the fatty oils released during roasting will attach to the CO2 on the grinds. Fatty oils are hydrophobic, that is, they dislike water immensely. But these solubles attach to CO2 and this then mixes in with the water. If you're making espresso, then this combination of CO2 and fatty oils, which contains all the flavor, results in the floating layer associated with espresso, known as la crema. Now, on to the siphon. We heat water in the bottom sphere. Remember the ideal gas law? High temperature creates high pressure. Due to the heat, the bottom sphere has a higher pressure than the top sphere. This forces the water from the bottom to the top through the connecting straw. This concept of pressure difference acting as a force is essentially how you drink from a straw. Don't forget to add your well-ground coffee to the siphon. Now, keep the heat on and all the water gets pushed up into the coffee grinds and absorbs all the flavor from the fatty oils. Give it 60 seconds so that the flavors can brew. Switch off the heat and watch gravity do its work. With the heat gone, the pressure in the bottom sphere decreases, so there is no force counteracting gravity anymore. The coffee falls down into the bottom sphere and the grinds are left behind in the top sphere, stopped by a cloth filter. Now it's time to pour the perfect cup of coffee. Look at it. Simply perfection. You won't be needing me anymore. You can take it from here. <laughs>